Many of us have heard the idea that stress is bad for our health. However, stress is only a part of the story. The other part is our response to stress. That is, how our body reacts under stress condition plays an important role. Many diseases are known to be associated with stress, such as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. I'll use cancer as a model to discuss the link between stress and diseases. In this study, the forensic pathologist analyzed 111 patients, 111 dead women within the age of 20 and 54. Those women died of causes unrelated to cancer and had no prior diagnosis of cancer. Yet 20% of them, that is one out of five, had cancer cells in their breast tissue. This is very surprising because in the general population of women who are alive and are within the age range, same age range, the diagnosis of cancer is 1%. That is 20-fold difference. This result was later confirmed by studies with more than 2,000 autopsies. Therefore, breast cancer is much more prevalent than we thought. And this phenomenon is not unique to breast cancer. It also applies to other cancer types, such as prostate cancer and thyroid cancer and others. So how do we reconcile the discrepancy between cancer instance and cancer diagnosis? In this figure, the green dot represents a cancer cell. You can imagine that as a seed in a vast land of soil. The seed cannot grow unless the soil provides proper environment. And this is what happens to cancer cells. They cannot grow unless the non-cancer cells in the host provide proper environment. Although we usually think of cancer cells as the enemy, they cannot succeed without us, the non-cancer cells, to help them. Thus, we have met the enemy, and he is us. You may ask, what happened? Why did the cancer cell switch? Why did the non-cancer cells change side and help the cancer cells? The answer is a series of complicated interactions between cancer cells and non-cancer cells. In the beginning of cancer development, our immune system recognizes cancer cells as abnormal and kills them. But in rare cases, very rare cases, some cancer cells escape the death and they can then sit there and survive for a long, long time. By chance, some cancer cells send out signals to affect the host cells, such as the immune cells and the blood vessel cells. Those host cells, in turn, send signals to affect the cancer cells, forming this loop of cancer-host interaction. This interaction loop continues to evolve, and the successful cancer cells are those who can flip or convert the immune cells from attacking them to helping them. Research from my lab indicated that one way, probably not the only way, but one way for cancer cells to flip the immune cells is to in turn on a gene called ATI3 in the immune cells. ATI3 stands for activating transcription factor three. My lab at Ohio State University have been studying this gene for many years. About 20, 25 years ago, we discovered that ATI3 is a stress-inducible gene. That means the gene is usually turned off, but it's turned on by many different stress signals, such as lack of oxygen, physical injury, or chemical injury. When we say the gene is turned on, we mean that the gene is expressed, and it's the final product, the ATI3 protein in this case, is produced. ATI3 protein functions like a switch. It can turn on and off many different other genes. One group of genes regulated by ATI3 are the genes modulating immune function. Since immune function plays an important role in the development of diseases, 
ATR3 is a link between stress and disease. So what, are, what, what do all this have anything to do with the ability of cancer cells to convert immune cells? In this experiment, we deleted ATR3 gene from the mice. They are called the ATR3 knockout mice because the gene is knocked out. They are identical to the original mice, the wild-type mice, in every aspect except the ATR3 gene. We injected both of them with breast cancer cells, the same breast cancer cells that have the ATR3 gene. Under the conditions we used, both groups of mice developed a tumor, and the size of tumor was about the same with a slight reduction in the ATR3 knockout mice. When we examined the lung to look for cancer spread from breast tissue to the lung, a process called metastasis, we found that ATR3 knockout mice had much lower metastases than the wild-type mice. The difference cannot be explained by the slight reduction of, of the tumor. Since the major difference between those two groups of mice is in their non-cancer cells, one with ATR3, one without, it means that ATR3 in the non-cancer cells is required for breast cancer cells to metastasize efficiently. Without going through the details, which are published already, our data support the following model. Cancer cells acting as a stressor send out signals to turn on ATR3 gene in non-cancer cells. Prolonged expression of ATR3 leads to immune dysfunction and flipping the immune cells from attacking cancer cells to helping cancer cells. Since cancer, the stressor, is applied to both groups of mice, it means that stress is not a whole story. How our body reacts to stress plays an important role. If we can reduce induction of ATR3 or inhibit the function of ATR3 after it is induced, we may be able to reduce cancer spread. In addition to the signals from cancer cells, ATR3 can be turned on by various stressors. The list is long, and I'm only putting a few of them here. Stress is unavoidable in life. Every day, we are bombarded with all sorts of stress signals. If for some reason, some cancer cells are already present, those stressors may be able to help the cancer cells to grow and to spread. To test this hypothesis, we selected chemotherapy as a stressor. Now refer to it as chemo. Chemo is often used or commonly used to treat cancer patients, and yet it is a stressor. So it is important to find out whether chemo can actually increase cancer spread. This led to the discovery of the chemo paradox. That is, chemo is a double-edged sword. It can kill cancer cells, but can also promote cancer cell spread. In this experiment, we injected breast cancer cells into wild-type mice and waited until the tumor is detectable. We then divided mice into two groups, one treated with chemo, the other without chemo. As expected, chemo reduced the tumor size. But when we look at the cancer spread, we were excited to find that chemo actually increases metastases. This is an exciting result because it uncovered the paradoxical effect of chemo. So despite the, of its apparent therapeutic benefit, chemo actually increases the metastasis. That's the detrimental effect of chemo. This chemo paradox was also reported by several other labs at the same time that we published our paper. So this is an exciting and an emerging theme in the cancer biology field. We then ask whether stress response involving ATR3 induction plays any role in the ability of chemo to promote metastases. For this purpose, we used ATR3 knockout mice. To our amazement, the detrimental effect of chemo was almost completely gone 
This is amazing because by deleting one gene, one stress-inducible gene, we blocked the detrimental effect of chemo almost completely. We were so amazed by the results, we actually repeated the experiment 12 times to convince ourselves that this is a true result. Because the chemo, the stressor, is applied to both group of mice, it means that how our body reacts to chemo plays an important role in determining the severity of its detrimental effect. So how do we explain all this phenomena? This figure represents a tumor with cancer cells in green, immune cells in blue, and blood vessels in red. In the past, the conventional wisdom was that cancer cells enter the blood vessel at places where the vessels are leaky. However, a few years ago, a team of scientists at Albert Einstein discovered that cancer cell enters the blood vessel at a specific place where a cancer, cells, a cancer cell and an immune cell, a specialized immune cell in red color, sit next to each other right on top of the blood vessel. As a unit, they function like, like a door. So when the cancer cell migrate over, the door opens transiently, let the cell in, and closes. This is an intriguing result because it changed the way we think about how cancer cells enter the blood vessel. We were very excited about the results because it revealed the insidious nature of chemo. On the surface, it shrinks the tumor, but underneath, in deep down, it creates more doors for cancer cells to escape. Consistent with this result, chemo also increased the number of cells in the bloodstream. We also found that chemo can modify the environment at the second site, long in our model. Chemo changes the immune cells there in such a way that when cancer cells arrive, the modified immune cells now help the cancer cells to set up shop and to grow into a detectable nodule. All those changes in the tumor and in the lung require HIA3 in the non-cancer host cells. That is, chemo, the stressor, induces HIA3 in the non-cancer cells, which is the soil, making the soil more fertile for the cancer cell, the seed, to escape from the tumor and to grow in the second site. I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, area enclosed by the red box for cancer cells at a microscopic level to grow into detectable nodule. They require the help from the non-cancer cells, it's particularly the immune cells with ATR3 induction. Therefore, our stress response may be an explanation probably not the whole story, but at least any explanation for the discrepancy we discussed earlier. That is, the discrepancy between cancer incidence and cancer diagnosis. So stress is unavoidable in life, but how we respond to it affects the ability of cancer to spread. Chemo is a stressor, and how we respond to it affects the severity of of its detrimental effect. If one day we can dampen the detrimental effect of chemo, we will be able to improve it as a treatment for cancer patients. Thank you.